Mm -hmm. I'm going to intro it, and then I'm just going to walk out of the frame. All right, 18.3 is out, and we're going to give you some first thoughts on this. Kyle's going to start with uh, some movement standards. I'll talk about pacing. This one's uh, going to be a lot of double-unders. That's 800 double-unders to be exact <laughs> if you finish the workout, although if you watched, neither of those guys got through the entire thing, so I'm not sure that there will be that many people who are actually so. getting through all 800, but regardless, this is going to take a major toll on your calves. There's no getting around that. Yeah. Um, in terms of the movement standards, like Brandon said, the biggest things were with the dumbbell snatch, and these are things that I just noticed last year watching our own athletes and, and watching some on-site athletes. Number one, make sure both heads of the dumbbell touch the ground. That is the standard. So when it's on the ground, both heads are touching before you pull. Um, the new standard with exchanging hands, you can't have the dumbbell pass above the head. One head of the dumbbell has to pass below the top of your head in order to exchange before hands. You switch. Um, Make sure that you have your judge hold, hold you to your non-lifting hand, not touching your body. I even saw uh, during the demo some of the guys were, were doing that. They caught a couple no reps. Um, and then this is the biggest change is that you don't have to repeat a rep if you get no rep on like your right hand. So you get a no rep on your right hand, you can go ahead and switch to your left and go ahead. You don't have to repeat that right hand. So in terms of movement standards, those are the only things that really stood out as novel this year versus uh, previous years. But Regardless of what we say, make sure you go and look at the movement standards online. It's always important before you start the workout. The number one rule is to know the rules of your sport. Yes. You wouldn't play basketball without knowing the rules. Exactly. Don't do CrossFit without knowing the rules. Um, the second thing that we're going to cover here is just kind of equipment setup. Um, number one, make sure that you're either grips or tape on the bar. Again, the same thing that has been in the first week. You can't have grips and tape, so that's just a basic. But uh, at the top of the the bar muscle up, you can't remove your hands, so make sure that you're set up in a way that you can keep your hands on the bar all the way through the movement. And then the other thing that, you know, we were just talking about this right before we started filming, there's going to be so much loading on the calf. Make sure that you put like a gymnastics mat or something underneath you for when you come off the rings and come off the bar so that your calves are not absorbing all of that shock as well. You know, there's going to be people who I'm not saying that there's going to be calf ruptures or anything like that, but people's calves are going to be pretty wrecked. There could be strains and tears and things like that that could happen coming off the bar or coming off the rings because the calves are so fatigued. So that's just something to, to keep in mind in terms of equipment setup. Yeah, so as far as the actual setup goes, if you are trying to put a regional level time on the board or as, as many reps as you can get in the 14 minutes, what you want to do is have your rings and bars close to po as possible. So what we have set up at Training Think Tank HQ is the rings come out on, a, on basically a strut and then the bar is right behind. If you have that set up, that's perfect because then you're going back and forth. And then what I would have is your barbell sitting right next to the rings, basically just like parallel to the bar or exactly perpendicular to the bar, whichever way you're most comfortable with, and your rope right next to the barbell with your dumbbell out in front. So there's basically, as soon as you finish your double unders, whatever movement you're going to, it's one or two steps and that's it. That's gonna allow you to have faster transitions and not have to be walking across the gym. You know, a lot of people have their rings hanging up in the middle of the gym and they have to go over to the bar. So if you can move that around and make sure that you're set up so that you have, or you minimize your transitions, that makes sense because this is really gonna come down to that for a lot of people when you're talking about getting back to your rope and how many double unders can I get with 20 seconds left in the time cap that's gonna play a big role on the leaderboard for us. You know, in, in the previous workouts in the Open so far, transitions have played a big factor. There've been a lot of transition. This one, there are fewer total numbers of transitions versus some of the previous workouts, but it still matters. And you even saw Kyle Kasperbauer, you know, he was taking some longer breaks between some of the movements here. If you can get yourself to move directly from one movement into the next, bite off a chunk of it, like say you're moving from, you know, your set of bar muscle ups into the last set of 100 double unders, instead of going over there, put your hands on your knees and taking that rest, just bite off a chunk even if it's 20, then take a shorter break and then kind of work your way into the movement and get comfortable with it. That it tends to be a much better strategy than taking a really long break between transitions. Absolutely. So pacing in the workout, uh, th there are 800 double unders if you finish. We already talked about that. If you break that down for someone that has even fast double unders, that's six minutes and 40 seconds if you went unbroken. So let's just call that half the workout, right? It really is. If you're someone that's a little bit slower, you could be 720 or seven minutes and 30 seconds of total double unders. So let's call it what it is. 
the workout is double unders, and then everything else is mixed in between. That's not to say that the other things aren't important, but the efficiency of double under movement that you have is going to play a huge role in how well you do in this workout. So when we're talking about warm up in a minute, make sure that you're, you're feeling as comfortable as you possibly can with your double unders. Make sure you warm up well so that your shoulders, forearms, and calves are all warm and ready to do that many. And then make sure that you're efficient at them when you're in the workout. If you need a break, then break. There's no need to have to go unbroken on this, especially if you know that you're going to have problems with other movements in the workout. So take that break, get under control, and then get back and try to knock out another big set. I think that's going to be really so important. So essentially what you're saying is, the, from, from a pacing perspective, that by feel is probably going Absolutely. to be the best strategy here. Instead of saying, all right, I'm going to concretely break my double unders in the second set at 50-50, because you never know when you're in the middle of a set of double unders when you might miss or or something like that. The other thing, and this is not so much a pacing thing, but just like a strategy perspective. When you break in double unders, especially early on, if you just trip up, that doesn't mean that you're tired and that you need a long break there. Just if you trip up, get right back into your double unders. Obviously, as the workout goes on, there may be some times when you need a little bit more rest. Uh, the other thing that I was going to add to the to the pacing thing is that if you're not particularly proficient with double unders, I would consider breaking them early on, just in the first set even. Just saying like, okay, my breaking structure is always going to be 40, 30, 30 from the start, and I'm going to approach every set like 40, 30, 30. Keep it in smaller, kind of like psychologically manageable chunks. That may help you as you get later into the workout. But if you're trying to put up a regional qualifying score, that's probably not going to be a, a good strategy yeah, for you. Yeah, well, the nice thing with the double unders, not to harp on those because we have some other movements to yep. talk about, but you can break on those and get back to them faster than any movement in CrossFit, right? So if you do your double unders and you break, it can be a two-second break and you're literally right back on the movement, but that can calm you down and relax you. Or if you trip, it's not the end of the world. Whereas if you come off the bar and bar muscle-ups or the rings, you have to wait for the rings to calm down. You're t t up there touching them, trying to jump back up to make sure that you can get back on the rings properly. Or chase or you, your bar on the exactly. On the overhead so squat. those are things that take longer. So it's okay to break on a double under. It's okay to make it 40, 30, 30 if you'd like. I think the big thing is making sure that you get back on them as quickly as possible. If you do end up tripping a couple of times. The other thing to put out here is that you know HQ takes the the way that they structure the workouts seriously. Like they they have tested this before, and a combination of holding a barbell over your head dumbbell over your head, gripping the rings over your head, bar muscle up, again, gripping over your head, it's going to be creating occlusion, you know, resistance to blood flow and all that stuff to the arms. And then you couple that with double unders, people's shoulders are going to get really smoked yep. in the middle of this workout. So this was not unintentional. Make sure that in your warm-ups you address uh, blood flow to the shoulders and things like that. And just open up tissues so that everything kind of flows freely. Absolutely. Just to kind of finish on the pacing aspect, I know we kind of drug this on a little bit, but with double unders, break is needed. Make sure that you get back on them as fast as possible. For the other movements, so the overhead squat and the dumbbell snatch, those are things that in your training, especially if you are a training think tank athlete, you've touched both of those probably multiple times already throughout the open, right? As we prep our athletes, you know which ones you're proficient at and which ones you're not. Come up with a game plan beforehand for those movements, but not necessarily the double under. So I have athletes that are really good at overhead squats. I'll tell them, knock them out unbroken. That's not going to be an issue for them. If you know you're not one of those athletes, come up with a game plan for those and then make sure you get back on your rope as fast as possible because those are fast reps for you, okay? Now the muscle ups, what would you suggest? You know, I know for athletes that are more proficient with muscle ups, I think typically going with a big set up front and then a smaller set to finish out. So just getting them done in two sets. You watch the guys on the announcement do that. I think that would be a pretty good strategy for how to approach those, those early sets of muscle ups. Later on in the workout, again, it's going to be broken by feel. You know, the best way to approach a big set of muscle ups is to get a chunk out of the way and then move on. If you're someone who just has two or three muscle ups, uh, you know, as a max set, then look at doing singles the entire time, just on a clock, regular pace singles, um, and stop the rings when you come down so that you can you know, get right back up into them as quick as possible. Choose a bar for your bar muscle ups that you can almost touch the ground. Absolutely. Uh, that way you can just continue to hit singles. I've seen people in the last two years in the bar muscle up workouts be successful doing singles on some of those workouts that had you know, 16, 18, you know, higher rep bar muscle ups. 
that could potentially be something that would be successful here, depending on what level someone's competing at. Absolutely. The last thing that I would mention on pacing, if you can finish on double unders, that's going to be a good place for you to be because you can make some ground up on the leaderboard because one rep only takes half a second, right? So if you do 20 reps, it takes you 10 seconds. That's an opportunity to get a ton of reps in a short period of time. So when you're looking at the clock, no matter how you feel, and if you're on your dumbbell snatch and you know that you only have five left, but there's 20 seconds left, get those done as fast as you can and get back on the rope so you can make up some ground there. You can get an extra 15 or 20 reps easily without having to worry about anything. All right, so let's talk a little bit about warming up for this workout. Uh, particularly, what what joints, what tissues are you looking to, to prep for something? You like already said it. So shoulders are, I think, are going to be the biggest one. I, everybody's going to talk about calves. We already mentioned that just because you're doing so many double unders. But the reality is, is that everything is on the shoulders, right? So the, the double unders, the overhead squats, the muscle ups, the dumbbell snatch, that's something that I'm going to have all of my athletes spend a ton of time making sure that they're warming up properly, making sure that they feel good, especially in an overhead position, just because in the rings, the bar, the overhead squat, and the snatch, you're going to be overhead. So not having any restriction up here is going to help and allow you to breathe in those movements, which is going to be important getting back to dumb runners not being jacked up. And having like the, one of the things that I've always found is like the longer you're holding something over your head or the longer you're gripping, right, you're creating all that tension in the forearms and the shoulders and that just fatigues. It makes so there's no blood and oxygen getting there. And then you're going on to the to the double unders, you're going to be gripping the rope and spinning it. So there's just going to be so, so little blood flow. The more you can open up the tissues and make it so that blood is getting there freely, I think the better you're going to perform in the workout. So I would spend a significant amount of time before I even started with the movements uh, opening up tissues in, in the upper body. The calves are obvious. I mean, that's yeah. going to be a, a major issue for people as they get into it. Um, and then the way that I would structure a warm up for a workout like this is to do an EWOM where I do, you know, 10 or 15 double unders and then I do one of the movements and the next minute I do 10 or 15 double unders and then the next movement in, in the workout and just kind of flow through that for a couple rounds until everything felt pretty good. Um, take your break and then go after it and prepare for six to 800 double unders yeah. depending on uh, how far you get into this thing. The last thing that I, I wanted to touch on was just recovery. Um, People who get done with this and have done 600 or 800 double unders, that is probably a training load that they're not used to. So their calves are gonna be sore when they get done. Some things to think about, contrast therapy for their calves. That could be like hot, cold therapy. That's gonna be a, a definite tool for them to, to help prevent some of that soreness. Uh, get compression on as soon as possible. And if you have access to it, like a light flushing massage, just to get everything out of those calves as quickly as possible. If you're going to repeat this, you're going to have to take your recovery seriously after the first Big attempt. Times. I think that's all I've got for tonight. Yeah. Good luck, guys. We don't have to do any weird jumps tonight. Yeah, do you want us to? I actually enjoyed that last week. Yeah.